Uh, it's my pleasure uh, to be here and to share with you my, uh, my fascination, actually, for this topic, death and space. Um, I'm very honored that you have taken uh, the effort to attend this uh, uh, public lecture. Um, you've been looking at this one way too long, so let's go to the next one. Uh, death and space in the Netherlands, planning and graveyards. That's what I want to talk about. But before I do that, I want to explain to you um, why I got pulled in this topic to, beginning, to begin with. Because it was never my intention to um, write an article, uh, supervise uh, master thesis students at the University of Groningen in the Netherlands where I teach, into subjects related to the geography of death. It happened. But I need to explain to you how that happened. Because it's all something of a fascination that developed. Um, why bother with a topic of death and space? Why would geographers, planners be interested at all or develop an interest in, uh, the, uh, in this topic of a geography of death? Um, there are four things which came across my desk, so to speak, and which gradually started building onto one another and pulled me into this topic. Population forecasts, employment figures, um, news reports uh, and research outcomes of spatial variations in the costs in the Netherlands of burying people, and finally reports of um, developments, a beginning of a shortage of burial space in the Netherlands for people that passed away. First, the first justification, so to speak, population forecasts. I learned that uh, in Europe, the Netherlands is actually um, only, um, together with France, the only country of the present 10 to 15 largest European countries where there actually will take place a population growth until 2050. Many other European countries will experience a population decline already before the mid of the century. But I realized after doing some calculations in the edge of the newspaper, as we say in the Netherlands, that the number of people that die every year in the Netherlands will grow tremendously with 65%, meaning that in the year 2050, not the present number of about 135,000 people in the Netherlands will die each year, but that number will have gone up to 225,000, an enormous increase, which of course is related to the aging uh, structure, population structure, the aging population. And that led to some questions. I asked myself, what do we as a society, the Dutch society, the Netherlands, do with those people that die? The additional, the growth in the number of deaths, 135,000 to 225,000. What do we do as a society? Do we bury them? Uh, do we cremate those people? What do those people, of course, want to have done with their dead bodies themselves? What kind of arrangements will they take? And since I'm a geographer, since I'm a planner, I ask myself, will there be in the already very crowded part of Europe called the Netherlands, will there be sufficient space to bury these people? Where will that space be and where will that space not be? That last question is of course even more important uh, in a small country. Um, then um, a while later, I came across employment figures, um, and I learned that in the undertaker business, in the undertaker sector in the Netherlands, job growth had doubled in just over 10 years' time, with actually the same amount of people dying in each of those two years, 1995, 2008, the amount of jobs had doubled. And I asked myself, why? What happened here? What kind of new jobs were created? Um, you might be aware of the fact, or you might not be, not be aware of the fact, that the Netherlands is part-time job economy number one in Europe. 
75% of the females that have a job have a part-time job. 22% of the males in the Netherlands that have a job have a part-time job. So, as an economic geographer, I was thinking, well, this is probably all a growth in the part-time job uh, part of the economy. But I didn't know. And I, I should add here that in the Netherlands, if you have a part-time job, you do not have another part-time job or a full job. People in the Netherlands almost never have two jobs. If you have a part-time job, then you do not have any other kind of job. That's the rule for about 85 to 90 percent of the people. Another question that came to mind was, um, well, perhaps it works the other way around. Um, perhaps a funeral procession, the whole act of um, things that need to be negotiated, need to be arranged for between the moment that somebody dies and the moment that somebody um, is buried or cremated, perhaps that has become more time intensive. Perhaps there are more rules and regulations. Um, or perhaps there's more outsourcing taking place, that families are now perhaps less involved in this whole process. I knew somewhere in the back of my head that in the Netherlands, we had a law until about 200 years ago that neighbors were responsible for burying a deceased person. The neighbors would have to go around the village and the town and uh, make it known to everybody that that, that person had uh, died and the neighbors were responsible for organizing the funeral procession and the burial procession. Um, but, um, uh, and later on, of course, families did more themselves. But perhaps now we are entering a stage that more of that kind of things are outsourced to professionals, to people working in the undertaker sector. Or, final thought here, Perhaps the, uh, uh, the increase in employment was just uh, uh, the outcome of the fact that we are a very wealthy country by and large and we spend more money on the funeral service and also more money, we have more money to spend on the services offered to uh, families by the undertaker sector. Questions, questions, no answers yet. Um, then, and this really um, um, put me over the edge, so to speak, uh, uh, got my interest, really developed my interest. I learned about the outcomes of uh, a nationwide so-called grave cost study, where it was revealed that in some years, the average price of a grave had increased significantly, 8%, 15%. Those are really high increases, considering the fact that they are average increases. But from other reports, we knew that there were very strong regional variations. For some graveyards in some parts of the countries, um, the grave cost price would double and it would mean, uh, it would be a big difference if you would bury somebody on December 31st or on January 1st, because January 1st, the fee could have been doubled because the municipality, the local authorities, just uh, doubled the prices. Um, so very strong spatial variations. And that resulted also in very strong spatial variations in grave costs. Now, I will not blame you for not immediately recognizing these two uh, names of places, of towns in the Netherlands. But there is one town, Bellingwede, where the act of digging a grave, preparing it for the funeral of somebody in a coffin, of lowering the coffin, filling up the grave again, and then renting that grave place out to the surviving next of kin to the family, that whole package, so that does not include the funeral procession itself where people gather afterwards or before in, in, a, in a church or in another community building, but only the grave-related costs cost 179 euro, so um, that is about 160 pounds, and the same activities somewhere else in the Netherlands cost almost 6,000 euro. That's, you know, for an economic geographer who is interested in 
regional variations in prices and explanations for those regional variations. This, of course, is fascinating material. So questions. Why these cost increases? Why these regional spatial variations in costs and in cost increases? And, but now I was already going nuts, some might observe the question, will those spatial variations in costs and in cost increases perhaps at one day cause, be the cause of so-called dead body migration, where people will no longer choose to be buried in the municipality, in the town where they have lived in the, lat, uh, in the last part of their life, but perhaps they will choose or their family will choose to have that person be buried in another municipality 10, 20 kilometers away where it might be much and much cheaper. Questions, questions. Um, and finally, the issue of an increasing number of reports that mention the fact that on many graveyards in the Netherlands, a, a shortage of space was developing. There was simply not enough space left to add new graves. And I should add here that I was at that time aware of the fact that in the Netherlands we already have this recycling behavior of graves. We do not use graves forever. In fact, our law says that a grave can only be used for, depends on the contract that uh, is being signed, 10 years or to a maximum of 30 years. And after that, you either have to put money on the table to extend that lease, so to speak, or your grave, or that of your deceased family member, of course, gets cleaned. That means that the body is taken out. Um, shortage of space, a big issue. Um, so all these things uh, together um, made me ask myself, um, what about the planning for graveyards? What does the future look like for planners at the local level involved in preparing sites and maintaining sites for the burial of their population? Um, what I then want to do um, before we get to some beginnings of answers to some of these questions, I would like to very much like to take some gigantic steps through history because only that made me understand partially the present day situation in the Netherlands. And I hope you don't mind that I take you through this walk through history at this moment myself. Um, first, looking at the past um, in the Netherlands, um, until about 1500 years ago, people were only buried outside the existing settlements. In those days in society, the so-called unclean dead uh, were separated from the living. There was a complete separation geographically. But around the year 500, as Christianity started to rise and expand, things changed dramatically. First of all, um, people were no longer cremated. That was, uh, had been done on a, on a, on a uh, low scale already uh, before 1500 years ago. Now people were all buried because of course Christianity and the belief in resurrection. And also people were buried inside settlements, inside existing towns, villages and cities. So a geographical reunification of the living and the dead. But that developed in its own way. Um, churches very quickly began, Dutch churches, began to sell places for graves in the church to the rich people, outside the church on the churchyard for the poor people. And that really became a money maker in the 9th, 10th century. Um, also because more and more people could afford to be buried in the church, but of course there was a, restri a restricted amount of uh, places in the church you actually see an economy of a huge demand and a, and, a, and a low supply of burial places in the church that had an upward pressure on the, on the churches. For the city of Amsterdam, for example, we know 
that um, in the 16th century, 70% of the church income was all because of burial fees that were raised. But problems developed. Here, and I hope that you can see this, um, geographers like maps, and this is a map of a church. Here you see exactly number uh, 36, 35, 34, 33. These are graves in a church. And what many churches experienced in the 16th and 17th century was the fact that their church buildings became overcrowded. Um, and they started to bury people more than one floor deep. Up to five floors of graves have been found in some churches. The church burial as a moneymaker. Also, the churchyards outside the church buildings became rather filled up. Of course, in a medieval town, walled city, walled town, um, high densities, graveyards could not expand because there were other buildings standing in the way. <coughs> Already in the 18th century, many people um, uh, demanded a stop of the burial practices in churches. Uh, this was not only for the Netherlands, of course. Uh, I think Scotland was the first uh, country region to um, establish um, a law where people could no longer be buried inside a church because it was seen as something uh, not that healthy. Um, and I should have added here uh, as an anecdote that we know of one church in the Netherlands where they were so eager to bury more and more people that they started to put graves underneath the foundations of the church. And yes, the church collapsed. So that was the end of that source of income for that religious community. Now in the Netherlands, um, already in 1829, a law was established saying that uh, burials could no longer take place inside settlements. That long law was not very strong. It did result that in many parts of the country, new burial sites were created outside settlements. So that was again the geographical separation for those communities. A stronger law was published in 1869, the so-called Law on Death Delivery. That really said quite seriously, no longer can people be buried in a church. The only exception is members of the royal family can be buried in a church in the town in the city of Delft. That's the only exception. And the dead people should be buried within five days after they die. And it literally said to be buried. Um, in the second half of the 19th centuries, all those new graveyards that were established outside cities were quickly swallowed up by the expanding, call it sprawling, although it was not really sprawl, it was urban expansion of cities. So once uh, graveyards that were built as graveyards outside cities were soon taken over by urban developments and again they were then uh, confronted with uh, limitations of space. Um, speaking of space, um, in the Netherlands we have two types of graveyards, so-called public or municipal graveyards. Uh, I put there the word market share of 75%. That means that 75% of the people that are buried are buried on such a graveyard. And we have so-called special graveyards, for example, Roman Catholic graveyards, Dutch Reformed graveyards, Jewish graveyards, military private family graveyards. Um, on each of these two types of graveyards, we have two types of graves. One is called the personal graveyard, uh, sorry, the personal grave, and the other is called the general grave. In a personal grave or a family grave, one, two, or three family members can get buried on top of one another. So we put down three layers of graves in one grave, three coffins in one grave. The law specifies that there should be, I think it's 50 centimeters of a certain type of sand in between, all kinds of regulations. And in general, uh, people can then um, rent that space on a graveyard for 20 years. Could be 30 years, but the general figure for most parts of the Netherlands is 20 years. And you have to pay that um, 
the rent for that space up front at the beginning of the 20 years. After 20 years, you could take an additional 20 years, but sometimes the graveyard will not allow for that, especially if the graveyard is reaching the limits of its capacity, cannot expand, they will not allow the surviving family to, uh, to take another uh, rental term of 20 years or 30, whatever it is. Another type of grave we have in the Netherlands are so-called general graves. And this is already part of the solution to the shortage of space. You could see this already as a very early planning solution. Because in a general grave, um, two or three bodies are placed with a lease term of most of the time only 10 years. But these are now bodies in one grave of people that not are, related, are not related to one another. So total strangers are placed above one another. And a lot of those general graves can be found in the more crowded, more densely populated uh, western part of the country. Um, very typical, these are personal graves or family graves. Um, you might recognize these from the situation here in, in Wales or in England. Um, the, the first grave uh, on the left is um, a husband has died. Um, his date of birth, date of death are already on the tombstone. His wife is still alive. Um, her name is on there, but without any dates. But she will later then be added into this grave. The next example is another personal grave with two people, um, the names of two persons and their birth date, date of birth, date of death, also to be found on the tombstone. But you can also see that there is still space on that tombstone for a third person to be added. Could be one of their children, could be a brother or sister of this man or this woman. Um, but it's a family grave. They can fill up all three spots, so to speak. These are general graves. Here you see um, three tombstones, tiny tombstones, and there will be three coffins underneath. This person lies way under, this in the middle, this on top. And um, this is already a solution to a shortage of space. You bury people on top of one another to save space. Uh, usually, uh, when this happens, like I said, in the crowded parts of the country, uh, the term is 10 years, and it cannot be extended, because it will be very problematic if the person on top, if the term, if his or her family would extend that term, but the term for the others would not be extended, you can never remove the, the lower lying bodies, of course, from that grave. So there's regulation uh, in detail here already. When we look at the spatial distribution of graveyards nowadays in the Netherlands, we can see, of course, a very strong relation with the existing settlement patterns. Um, we could say, of course, you say, well, um, um, if there's a town or a city that needs, and this is actually regulated by law, a municipality must provide for uh, a burial space for its residents, uh, you could say, well, of course. Um, but there's something else, um, and that is the walking distance. And that goes back to the fact that in the past, um, neighbors were responsible for burying a person. And that meant that the walking distance, because the neighbors also walked the deceased person in his coffin or her coffin to the graveyard. There were limits to the distance that could be covered. So there are, even in the less densely populated areas in the country, you will find many, 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 many smaller uh, graveyards. And also, because especially more in the past than nowadays, uh, people with a Roman Catholic uh, uh, signature uh, religion, they would prefer to be buried on a Roman Catholic graveyard, on a special religious graveyard. So we also see, even in the less densely populated areas, we see a large number of graveyards. And in each village, even though it would be the smallest village, they would have at least three graveyards. Um, the, um, the planning challenge uh, becomes even more clear now when we look 
at the suitability of the Netherlands for burying people. Um, you might know that the Netherlands is not a very good country to go uh, to if you would want to go on a skiing holiday, right? We're a flat country. We don't have mountains. But the fact that the country is flat gives us some other problems. And these problems have been um, groundwater and the soil conditions. Um, historically, um, if you look at the Netherlands, I said we're one of the most densely populated countries in the world. Uh, the population density is now approaching the 500 people per square kilometer of land figure. That's really high. But it becomes even more interesting when you realize that 90% of the Dutch population lives on 10% of the land surface in the Netherlands. So we're not scattered around, equally distributed over the country. There are a lot of, to be precise, 2,026 of them. There are 2,026 concentrations of people <coughs> where 90% of the population lives on together 10% of the land. Um, what does this mean? This means that the other 90% of the land has never been that suitable for establishing a village or a town. They were wet, muddy, close to the sea, close to the rivers. They were vulnerable for flooding. Um, and um, so that's why I say here that the um, cemeteries, especially after that stronger law of 1869, where cemeteries a burial places were um, ordered to only be established outside existing settlements. They were, by definition, uh, ordered to be in the second best or third best locations. And the problems. I hope this map is a little bit clear. The dots are the 3,012 known cemeteries in the, the Netherlands. And then the map should reveal greenish space and pinkish space. I hope you can see that. I know that this map, I could not get it in a better quality. Um, sorry, wrong direction. Um, this map reveals the groundwater. And the only in the green areas is the groundwater, on average, low enough to allow for unproblematic graves or burials. In the pinkish areas, the groundwater, average groundwater level, is too high, comes too close to the surface, or is even actually sometimes above the circus, uh, surface, and then we call it a flood. Um, our law says that the average groundwater level on a cemetery should be uh, not higher than minus 80 centimeters, so 80 centimeters below the surface level. And then you can bury up to three um, coffins in one grave. Um, only the green areas are suitable. And we don't have time to go in details, but some of you might know that parts of the country, especially over here and here, have been reclaimed from the sea. Um, this is a land reclamation. Uh, finished in the 1960s. Uh, it now has, for example, the city of Almere, which is the fastest growing city in Europe and will remain to be the fastest growing city in Europe for quite some time. But that area is green, but it's below sea level. It's five meters below sea level. But it shows you, as a side note, that the quality of reclaiming land and water management has improved significantly compared to earlier parts of that land reclamation project. OK, if your groundwater surface, uh, if your groundwater level is too high, the solution is you put in all sorts of mechanisms to pump the water out. But I think we can all imagine that costs money. Second problem is that we have is that, um, oh, well, why, why, why? Sorry, I forgot why. Um, why is it not a good idea to bury people in a very wet, soaky underground? Does anybody? Pollution. Pollution. Oh, yes, yes. That's one thing that um, if you would bury somebody who has, in recent days, modern technology, 
has received chemotherapy uh, or has been very ill, um, uh, that could be transported by the groundwater level. Yeah, that's one thing. But there is even a more... That's too complicated for most people working at a graveyard in the Netherlands. So, <laughs> no, there's a more serious thing. Yes? Exactly. The bodies do not decompose. Water prevents decomposition. In fact, water can do the opposite. If people, if a, if a dead body, even of animals, but if a dead body is buried in a very wet circumstances um, because of some sort of chemical reaction, Sometimes, well often, but not always, a chemical reaction takes place and a layer of body fat develops around the, the corpse. And uh, to be honest, this is a very nasty sight whenever you see a corpse um, uh, uh, affected by water like this. I don't have a picture of that here. I will not show it here. Um, but that's the reason why burying in water is not good. You need to bury people in um, a situation where oxygen can penetrate um, to, uh, to uh, assist the degrading process, the deterioration process. And that is also the relationship here with this second problem. Uh, the Netherlands is, of course, a, a delta region. And in the past, a lot of peat has, been, um, has developed. And very little sand has been deposited by the rivers, uh, the European rivers in the past, and the local rivers. And on this map, the yellow areas, that is where the underground is, of, um, is sand. And sand is much better as an underground than clay or peat, because in clay or peat, apart from the fact that they are very wet themselves, so that just doubles the groundwater problems, but only in sand can oxygen penetrate. And can you have a, a degrading deterioration of the dead body? So, for two-thirds of our graveyards, we, have, we know, are aware of this problem. The solution here is to bring in sand, to dig out peat, dig out clay, bring in sand, and then you can start your uh, funeral place, your burial place, your graveyard. But that, of course, also costs money. So, to sum it up, the direct effects for the planning of graveyards of these soil and groundwater conditions are additional costs. It's more expensive. Um, it's not always possible to bury three floors deep in general graves because you might get too close to the groundwater level. Um, more important, and still a very important reason today, there is a reluctance or a hesitation to clean graves after that legal term of, what is it, 10, 20 years, whatever the contract was. Uh, people working at graveyards will say, well, it's been very wet the last couple of years. We're not going to clean those graves because we are a little bit afraid of what we will find. That is that they're saying it might be that we discover that the bodies have not fully deteriorated. Other people will say, well, out of respect, we shouldn't bury clean graves anyway, but this is always also a reason. And the immediate consequence of that has been historically, because we know of this problem already for a long time, so it's, it's been a planning problem already for a very long time, is that instead of what the law had anticipated, that graveyard space would be reused on the spot after legal terms would expire and the bodies could be taken out. Nobody's asking me, what do you do with those bodies, by the way? Well, I'll tell you right now, we collect the bones because that's what you hopefully only get. Bones are collected in a mass grave, and, and that is later then on reused. Um, I'll say no more. But the immediate consequence here was that instead of the reuse of space, cemeteries have had the ten tendency to expand horizontally. And if that was not po uh, possible because of already existing structures, then a municipality would create a new cemetery, a new graveyard somewhere else in the municipality. And finally, and we just spoke about that, that environmental 
threat of chemicals and, and other things that would be released in the groundwater. Okay, so talking about additional costs, um, additional expenditures necessary for burying people in the Netherlands. Let's look at the cost figure. If you look at a Dutch cemetery, they have various sources of income. They're listed up there. I will not read them out loud. And various expenditures. But the bottom line is that for many graveyards in the Netherlands, the expenditures are often almost twice as high in any given year compared to the sources of income, the grave rights, the fees, and so on. And I just put down here one example, the municipality of Hogeveen, which was confronted with this shortage in 2006. They're one of the few municipalities that were very open about this. And this figure of expenditure for, of 1.1 million does not even include that the city council had decided that they would need a new graveyard to meet the future needs of their population. And that the costs of just building a one-time cost expenditure of constructing building that new graveyard was also 2.5 million euro. So it's this kind of financial problems at the lower level. In the Netherlands, municipalities are not allowed to make a profit on burying people. And they have always been very careful about avoiding um, you know, the, the, the image that they were earning money. But the only solution in the last 10 years that many municipalities have seen is to indeed make the so-called grave costs uh, a truer, a better reflection of the actual costs. And they have uh, started to increase the burial fees. This has happened in many parts of the country. But of course, what I summarize here with public discussions, a lot of people were upset by that. How can it happen that um, from December 31st to January 1, you now pay double or even triple the price for burying somebody on the municipal graveyard? Um, which is there by law anyway, because the municipality has the obligation to provide for burial space for its residents. So there were very heavy discussions um, in city councils, in newspapers, everywhere. This is a map that a colleague and I produced. Uh, we were very lucky. We got hold of a database for 2005 with all uh, well, for almost all graveyards in the Netherlands, um, the grave costs, but then you have to know for each uh, um, graveyard, you can choose nowadays between 10 or 15 different types of graves. And if you in the Netherlands are buried on a Saturday morning, that is double the price of what it is on a normal weekday, all kinds of price variations. But we got hold of this database and we made this map and the very dark colored areas, which are municipalities, there the, um, the grave costs are on the high end. I think over 2,250 euro in this example. And in the light colored areas, the grave costs are lower, uh, less than 700 and, or less than 1,250 euro per year. But the two extremes, I already uh, pointed them out earlier, are to be found here. But even here on this map, you can see that almost in every part of the country, you will see municipalities with, uh, on the high end of, uh, of the price range and in the same region, in the same province, um, municipalities on the lower end, on the cheaper end of this uh, bandwidth. The only exception you could see is down here where it seems all to be lower than average. That can be explained because that is a little bit higher and that is more of a sand underground where cemeteries did not need to uh, implement additional uh, facilities. Um, cremations could be a very good alternative. The rate of cremations in the Netherlands has gone up in recent years. 
um, in 2003, it passed the 50% mark. Uh, cremations are compared to the um, a comparable part of a funeral, much cheaper. And, but the newest trend right now is that people get cremated and then their ashes, which is about uh, two and a half kilo of ashes for you and perhaps about four and a half kilo of ashes for me, uh, are then burn, uh, buried in an urn on the graveyard. So cremations are not um, uh, reducing the amount of burial space on graveyards completely. I wrote down some other figures for cremations. Um, Great Britain, 71%. Um, on the right, France, Spain, Italy, Ireland, much lower, of course, uh, very much in line with their religious cultural uh, profile. Um, allow me to start making some concluding remarks about death, space, and cyberspace. Um, in the Netherlands, um, and I'm, I'm sure it's something similar happened here and in other European countries, in the 1960s and 70s, we experienced in the Netherlands that death became less and less visible in society. Um, people no longer died at home in a two or three generation house. People died in, uh, in a hospital or in a nursing home. Um, since the 1990s in the Netherlands, we've seen a very strong counter trend where more and more attention is being given to people that die to death and there's much more openness, more publications, more openness in memorial advertisements. Uh, one thing here, uh, this historically, um, we still have the habit if somebody dies, then there will, uh, a memorial advertisement will be published in the local paper. I'm sure that happens here as well. But in the Netherlands, it almost always happens. It comes from our old law in the 1700s where the neighbors were supposed to inform the community that somebody died. Well, it translated into memorial advertisements in papers. Now we read in memorial advertisements, um, Paul was a difficult guy, so no wonder he took his own life. It's all open there. Um, not always, not everybody, but there's much more openness. Or this was a, well, I, don't give, I won't give you an example, as you can imagine. Cemeteries. Um, got much more attention as cultural heritage. A lot of graveyards are now on our monument list. And after 2000, and this is very exceptional for the Netherlands, roadside memorials started to develop. And first, these were not tolerated. These would be taken away immediately. But there was such a massive movement of people wanting to erect a roadside memorial that now the, um, the managers, the local authorities responsible have said, well, it's too much if we start removing them all the time, let's let them be. So now we have roadside memorials, which, do you have roadside memorials here as well? Uh, they're much more common and have been much more common for a longer period of time in other cultures, but not in the Netherlands. My conclusion is that death is now uh, no longer absent, but much more present in society. Um, and people are much more engaged in, in funeral procession. This is a typical funeral procession. Um, grandchildren uh, uh, put drawings on the coffin. People are not dressed very formally, as you probably will, will agree with me. Um, and there's a world of brightness and light and colors. First, this started with the graves and the coffins for younger children, as you can see here. Um, but now, tombstones. They have become many pieces of art, of individual expression. Um, also, people um, now are very selective. Um, they make choices. Uh, people prepare their own funeral much more. And people, person that lived on a, on a, on a houseboat will say, I want to be uh, transported to the graveyard over water or by means of a bicycle or I was a, um, how do you call that, a hell's angel, I want to be transported by one of those motorcycles, something like that. Much more individual involvement. And this then raises the question in the next part of my 
um, reasoning here, that perhaps we are approaching the end of the physical graveyard as we know it. No longer the graveyard where people go to to um, remember and mourn about the deceased person, but now internet. There are all sorts of remembrance sites on the internet. Um, and one of the most fascinating that I came across was, I know that here in Europe, myspace.com has not become very big, but it has become very big. Or do you know myspace.com? It was very big in the United States, but the people, the members of myspace.com that deceased could then get an opening, an entry on mydeathspace.com, where people would mourn and write down stories and, and give explanations and background to the deceased person. And that really raises the question, will this in part take over the function, one of the functions of a graveyard where you go to, to uh, be one again with your deceased uh, beloved one. These are really my conclusions. I can do that really quick. Two pages. I'll just concentrate on the green arrow stuff. I think that in the Netherlands, yes, we will experience an ever increasing and increasing shortage of space for graveyards. Um, Expanding graveyards, building new graveyards is just too costly. Um, secondly, I therefore think that the costs of graves for individuals will continue to increase strongly. More specifically because municipalities are pressed to uh, charge real cost level prices and no longer directly or indirectly subsidize graves. Um, thirdly, um, also because, and this is not on the sheet, also because we have a growing segment in our population for which um, resurrection in their religious uh, belief is very important, um, we allow them to be buried forever. They can purchase a spot on a graveyard uh, forever, unlimited, not 10 years, 30 years, but unlimited. But they have to put a real big sum of money on the table, 15,000 euro in the municipality where I work, University of Groningen, City of Groningen. Nevertheless, I do think that burials could, and perhaps even should, some hesitation here, be discouraged a little bit more. I think price is a very strong mechanism in the Dutch society, and therefore I think that the share of cremations in the future will increase. And I think, finally, that there will be more active cleaning, removal of older graves. But this is a mentality change that still needs to be implemented. Thank you, but I apologize for taking up a little bit more time.